Hello, everyone. It's Michael Hubicki, the host of The Thriving Mayor Show. It's June 23rd, 2021, and today I'm really happy to continue with part two of episode 27, Chief Dave Mowat of Alderville First Nation in Ontario. This show was obviously pre-recorded, and this is part two, but we always welcome social media comments and posts uh, either during the live show or afterwards if you would like to leave a comment. I always do my best to, to monitor those and to respond. I will begin this episode by honoring the Bay of Quinte lands and the Indigenous peoples who've lived here from the beginning. I'm grateful for the opportunity to live here and thank all of the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. In particular, I honor the ancestors of the land, the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee peoples. This territory is covered by the 1783 Crawford Purchase. In part two, we continue Chief Mowat's pre-recorded interview and learn about his living art approach to history. Dave shares his thoughts about his musical band, Dave Mowat and the Curbside Shuffle, how the harmonica found Dave in North Winnipeg, creating the art between history and music, governance of Alderville First Nation, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's work is not over, and that our, our learning in Canada is really just beginning. Please enjoy part two, and we hope to see you next week when the guest of our show is Mayor Jeff Lehman of Barrie, Ontario. Remember to comment and subscribe to the show. Here we go. And speaking of photographs, just to change uh, directions a little bit, I noticed you've got the Beatles Abbey Road behind you. <laughs> And, and that room like, looks like it might be kind of a secret den where there's a lot of music, uh, like a beat lab maybe, or? Yeah, you got it, you got it. That's it. Like every, every guy like my, I'm being a musician has to have his little, uh, his little cave and his little getaway room. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and and, and uh, you, what's the name of your band, Dave? Well, um, you know, uh, I named uh, my band uh, Dave Mode and the Curbside Shuffle. Uh, going back um, a lot of years, actually, um, back to when my Winnipeg days. Um, and how would I have ever known that curbside would be become such a major part of our lexicon today? <laughs> curbside. In the last year, it's been curbside this, curbside everything. And they had sort of made up that name. Um, Pre-1995, I was still yeah. playing in Winnipeg. And I just used it. Uh, I just it came to my mind because you know the bars i played were always we'd always stand out on the curb yeah on, bre on break and you know hang and and then um i also remember um one time i was walking down george street in peterborough with my mother and uh, i was on the outside towards the curb and she was no no she was on the outside next to the curb and i was on the inside yeah and she said to me you know david you're supposed to walk on the outside. Yeah. And so we did the little, what I call the curbside shuffle. Oh, that's beautiful. So, yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, it, think... just, it just signifies, you know, it signifies for me, um, the music of the, you know, blues music playing it in the, in, on, on the streets of Winnipeg. I did play on the streets sometimes, you know, busking or whatever. And then, you know, uh, a generation later, curbside has become so popularized because of the pandemic. Should have trademarked it. I should have. I should have. You got her. Oh man, maybe with your with your history uh, prowess, maybe you can go back and make it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, for a past a past will be forward. That's awesome. And uh, and you you sing and play the harp. Yes. Um, I I relocated to Winnipeg um, in 1982, August 1982. I was um, my family then. We were. Uh, heading to Edmonton, actually, that was the plan. And, you know, didn't have any money and stopped in Winnipeg and for a couple of days breather. And uh, at the time, and I looked at the newspaper and I thought, I'm not going any further. I'm staying here. I can the get a Winnipeg job here. Free Press. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I said, I can get a job here. That's right. I was sitting in a sales restaurant on Donald Street, like I never forget it, looking <laughs> at a Winnipeg Free Press. And I uh, said, yeah, I'm not going any further. I'm staying here. What time of year was that, Dave? 
Uh, it was about August 7th, August 8th, 1982. Oh, yeah, August, right. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and so I just had two little boys at the time. Uh, one was only three months old, less than three months old. And uh, times were tough, times were hard. Um, but uh, within four months or maybe around four months, I was playing harmonica. So I say that the harmonica found me. I didn't find it. And oh, somehow wonderful. I found it in Winnipeg. And, um, and I chased it. And I just kept practicing and learning and practicing and, and, and I just chased it down and, and then met guys over the short next three, two years or three years. And, and then we started a band and just like, you know, thousands of other bands start. And, and um, I just chased the blues and then chased some of the veteran players in Winnipeg, Big Dave McLean, Gord Kidder, Brent Parkin. And I would just jump on their back pockets and, and be everywhere they were and, and eventually started to meet some of the American players. And, and so it became a real passion. And, uh, and uh, you know, I've just, uh, I'm really moved by being able to play uh, in front of public and, and to work with a band is a really unique experience. It's just yeah. nothing like working with a band. Yeah. So. so you get, you get to work with two bands. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Two bands. Yeah. You bet. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, my dad played the harmonica, and uh, he cut a, a CD with Carlos Del Hunco. Oh, I know Carlos. Very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Carlos invited him to a studio, and he, he did like a 10-track 10, 10 CD with my dad. Excellent. And, uh, and he, my dad wanted the cover of a CD to be him walking on the railway tracks. Oh, yeah. So we were in Coburg. Uh, right by the train station and we had to look both ways make sure there's nobody coming and then he was walking and I took the photo with kind of the sun setting right. and behind him and yeah it's uh he and we you know still listen to that track he's 90 now wow, and it's good for it, and good he and him. he uh he still has his harmonica and he plays it three or four times a day picks it up and good beautiful instrument yeah very complex instrument uh, yeah not uh seen as uh, um seen as that but it is it's very complex um carlos is quite a master of it uh, he sure is and um but it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing it's i've been really fortunate to have it in my life and and uh it's a certain level of freedom that that exists by having that in my life it's yeah. my own it's my own thing and it's uh and you know it's taken me places i never thought i would be able to go and and it, there's a freedom in there that I really, um, I really uh, hold on to tightly. It's so interesting, Dave. Just like your passion and your your um, your prowess for history, which is the past, and then the music, which is is always ever changing, mm -hmm. and and the the flow of it and the the beat of it and. It's uh, it, it's those kind of those two extremes, and 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 the way that you explain it, it's uh, it's really interesting. And I guess for politics, is somewhere in the middle. So we're, we're yeah. dealing with the past, and we're dealing with this sort of this fluid uh, people's emotions and people's expectations and demands. And how, so is that does that those two kind of mindsets come together for you and being well, a chief? You know, uh, for music, like. And, you know, I got started in Winnipeg. I, maybe I started late. Like, I didn't start playing harmonica at seven years old, like little Walter. But um, I started playing when I got to Winnipeg, basically. Um, you know, and eventually started, my audience was um, Indigenous people of Winnipeg. It's a, there's a lot of poverty, poverty in Winnipeg. Yeah. There's racism there. A lot, a sizable, large Indigenous population. Um, and so my audience became, you know, indigenous people, gangsters, drug dealers, um, poor people, rich people, mm -hmm. you know, the all cross section of society. And, and so for me, um, playing music got me as close as you can get. And to uh, a lot of those uh parts of the population mm -hmm. that you don't maybe don't normally see um or don't normally get to know yeah um you know i remember a lot of people that were poor and and really just loved to be able to listen to music and and so that's been an important part 
of the music is is the audience that I've been able to play to, and uh, and then in politics, of course, you have to have your finger on on the same people, you know, um, people that are poor, um, people that are addicted, um, people that you know uh, are educated. Like they're all cross sections as yeah. well, of of um, and even in a First Nation community, like we we have a people that are all over the map in, in their in their lives you know um trades people people that are uh you know uh don't have as much say and uh any chief would know that um in alderville for sure because of where we're located we have good education rate um, good housing standard um we have professionals lawyers doctors um uh teachers you know uh all over the map people at all levels of society and so um there is a commonality between that politically and and the, and musically um because uh like i say uh you know music is a uh f from my experience uh, it's a it's uh there's a freedom there and even if somebody can go out and listen listen to music i know we've been really suffering without it yeah. because of the pandemic yeah um you know there's a freedom there and and there's a it's it just allows people to set themselves free even if it's for an evening you know it's that's i just love it for that purpose and and you know artistically and or creatively uh the creativity wise um it's 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 it's, it's its own thing it's it's unique and and uh, i i really look at it as um it's freedom yeah that's what it is it's freedom from oppression oppression and it's it's freedom it's my own thing and i'm my own boss when it comes to that and um um and so but with political politics of course you're you're not it's not the same way in that yeah. sense you're you're you know you're um you're you're at the the behest of the community and um and it's a little it's different on that on in that sense but yeah. as far as the people go it can there's a lot of commonalities yeah 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 really uh really interesting perspective and i and i have and i you know in my experience i i was able to hang and play with some of those american cats like you know the guys that came out of the tw um, 20s and 30s i was fortunate enough to hang with people like honey boy edwards and i played with hubert sumlin who was howlin wolf's guitar player and um and uh hung hung out with junior wells and sunny land slim when i would when i was living in winnipeg i would save my money to go to chicago to find my heroes and yeah you know um and these guys came up through the jim crow south the racism of the american south and and so that too and then again being a historian i was always intrigued by by their experience coming up yeah, through, yeah. through music so yeah yeah, history, really awesome. history envelops me in in all ways. So is it is, is there a link, Dave, that we can uh, we can share in the show notes to any of your performances or any recordings or? Um, you know, I've been on some albums, uh, probably sessions, uh, played in sessions on ten albums, probably. Okay. Um, I don't. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a really good business person when it comes to that. I, I'm still a rough and tumble sort of player. And well, you, um, you got a live show coming up in August, I think. If I do, people. finally. And where is that? Oh, it's actually going to be at Rose Neath next door to Alderville. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was playing in Toronto quite a bit before the pandemic hit. I was playing the Cameron House and uh, the local uh, on Rossi, and and okay. I was uh, I was really tapping into Toronto, and then boom, the bottom fell out. Oh, so man. it's going to take us a while to get back into the scene there. Um, yeah. But yeah, we do have a gig coming up in, in August. There's a, there's a series that a, a local woman, uh, she's booked the uh, agricultural, one of the buildings over there at the fairgrounds yeah. to run yeah. a series, to run a series of concerts this summer. So if all the numbers stay good and, yeah. uh, and everybody continues to get vaccinated, uh, we'll actually be playing. I think it's August 18th. Um, so we're pretty pumped about it and we're just hoping that uh, everything stays good in so far as the pandemic and the numbers and vaccinations we're doubly we're doubly double vaccinated at, at alderville now 
Oh, um, that's awesome. Yeah, that was one of my uh, things I uh, was going hardcore on is making sure that we would have the vaccination clinics run in in the community because as a First Nation, we were uh, in phase one of the, yeah. uh, the vaccination rollout. So yeah, I'm, I'm proud to say that we were able to uh, uh, get over well over 500 members vaccinated and their immediate families. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Dave, we're, we're getting close to our time, but I just wanted to ask a little bit about the wild rice harvesting. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, yeah, uh, is that something that you've always been doing or, or and uh, are, are you, when you harvest, are you, is it for your own personal consumption or like, I don't, I don't really know anything about it. Yeah, I've been doing it for a long time and mentored, mentored in it by uh, my buddy, my friend, uh, Jeff Beaver here in Alderville years ago, but um, um, the harvest, uh, it starts to come on in late August. Yeah. And then we, we really go out to harvesting in September. Um, and it's um, in the Anishinaabek tradition, the migration story talks about when the people left what was presumed to be the Atlantic seaboard, they, they were told in one of the, um, uh, in the um, in the, the the stories that came down to them to to move west and don't stop until you come to where the food grows on the water, which is the wild rice. Oh, the interesting. Yeah. Um, so we do harvest uh, in. Uh, I don't really give it away where we harvest, um, but we harvest in our treaty areas, um, Treaty Twenty Seven, which is above Kingston, uh, above the Crawford Purchase Territory. We harvest in Treaty Twenty, and um, and we do it the old way, out of the out of a canoe, mm -hmm. with the rising rising sticks, um, and um, the paddler is in the front, the harvester is in the back, and um, and we use it only for personal consumption and or give it away. Yeah, uh, I've got a lot of rice in my garage. I still have to process, <laughs> and we process it all the traditional way. Uh, using an iron kettle and over a slow burning fire and put the moccasins on and dance it in the iron kettle and winnow it. Uh, the only technology I use is for winnowing. I maybe set up a fan to when I winnow it and blow the chaff off. Uh, but it's all the old traditional way. It's a beautiful tradition and it's a lot of hard work. Yeah. Very, lab very laborious. Um, but, um, you know, and it, it goes in cycles as well. In the last few years, it's been sort of thin, um, hard hit by climate change, I'm going to say, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, like last year was not all that good. Uh, but then, depending on the strain, uh, it might be better in other areas than it is in other ge geographical areas. Like we harvest on the Mississippi River in, uh, near Ardock, Ontario. Um, and there's some sizable rice beds there, but they've been pretty thin. Uh -huh. And um, but whereas there's other stands, even a small stand in in the Rice Lake area, and it's healthier. So it goes in cycles. Um, and uh, we're in a drought here too, so this could have a, a yeah. Even yeah. though it grows in the water, even though yeah. it grows in the water, uh, one would think that it just flourishes. Well, it just just doesn't work like that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a really important part of my life. And uh, it has been an it has been an important part of the life of Alderville First Nation, and it's one of our links back to our to our early um, our early days. Yeah, awesome. And and as Chief Dave, do you have uh, are you are you, are you have a two year term? Yes, as Chief. Quite so when's your next short. election? And and do you have big plans or any any more kind of uh, goals that you're you're looking to to achieve? Well, um, we're in the election mode right now. Our election is on July 9th. Wow. Um, two years is too short. Uh, yeah. But it's, uh, because we're an Indian Act band, um, if we want to change that, we would have to enter into the First Nations Election Act or, um, or uh, work towards a custom code, uh, custom election code. Uh, but right now we're constrained by that old colonial act, uh, the Indian Act. Uh, it's hard to get things done in two years, but we, our council, uh, myself and our four councillors, we, we hit the ground running and we accomplished quite a bit in our two years. 
Um, and so moving forward, uh, you know, education and assuring that our, our people can be educated and that they, we have the resources for that. We did settle the Williams Treaty Settlement Agreement in 2018, and that gave us a sizable financial uh, injection, and we are protecting that for the benefit of the community, uh, for the here and now and for the future. Mm -hmm. So that's important is to, is to keep protecting that, those resources. Um, we, held, we, held, we, held, we hold a fair amount in trust, and we have a board of trustees, and we're, we're doing that all uh, um, for the benefit of today and, and, and the tomorrows that will come. Um, and purchasing more land. Um, oh, interesting. Out of, the, out of the Williams Treaty Settlement Agreement, each of the seven First Nations has a legal entitlement to purchase 11,000 acres to add to the reserve. So mm. that's a process that could take the next 20 to 30 years. So that's a really critically important piece of my work as well as is uh, acquiring more, more land. Uh, but working with the Indian uh, uh, Indigenous Services Canada or Indigenous Crown Relations is sometimes like moving a rope up a hill, pushing a <laughs> rope up a hill. Yeah. It's uh, anchored in its colonialistic attitudes and it's really frustrating. Um, but you just got to keep bashing out the doors and, and knocking, you know, knocking the walls down. Uh, there's just no other way to do it. So uh, as each First Nation in Canada would know, it's not a picnic, that's for sure. When you're dealing with old colonial attitudes and, and uh, you know, dealing with Parliament um, and, and that, that whole weight of, of uh, history upon the government of Canada, it's really, really difficult to deal with. But, um, yeah. Um, yeah. but, our, but our council, I'm going to say in the last two years, our council has taken a lot of positive things on and, and we've helped to, uh, to move the community forward. Um, we've invested in our infrastructure and invested in our education and our children. And, and so um, that's sort of where I'm coming from is just to maintain um, the investment in the community, to keep building on the land base and to, to protect the environment as well, critically important. Absolutely, and for all of us. Yes, indeed. It, it, absolutely, it's, uh, it's just critical. The, um, back in the, my last question, Dave, I know we, we run, run quite a bit over with this fascinating, fascinating uh, insights here. There, you had mentioned that in, at Queen's University, there was a public art uh, right. initiative and, and is that something at Alderville or for Alderville or yeah it what it what does uh, in 2013 our former chief uh, Jim Morrison uh, he helped to move the idea of a commemorative project forward and I was involved uh, at that time I was on council then I was on council for here here for uh, from 2007 to 2015 so I was involved in that as well but uh uh, since 2017, City of Kingston, they uh, committed $150,000 to a, a commemorative, a public art installation, and uh, and then since my election, I've continued to help move that forward. So it's actually completed. That's a beautiful installment at Lake Ontario Park in Kingston. Okay, and um, we are having a a small unveiling on June 21st. Uh, so summer solstice day and indigenous yeah. people's uh, day. Um, and then uh, of course, because of the COVID measures, we can only have a small group uh, and we might uh, have a larger on a group uh, event later. Uh, but um, it's just beautiful. It, it, it uh, commemorates our history at the, at Kingston at the Bay of Quinney and our treaty history and our, our wampum history and, um, also the influence of the Methodist church. Um, and so I've seen some of the photographs of the installment. It's just, it's just beautiful. So yeah, I'm looking after, forward to seeing that after June 21st, you'll be able to go to Lake Ontario park and, and, uh, um, and take a look at what's been accomplished. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Dave, would you like to share any last thoughts, uh, with us? Well, I would just say that in light of, uh, Kamloops and in light of uh, this new chapter that we're entering in so far as uh, you know uh, unmarked graves and uh, potential alleged mass graves um, that the truth and reconciliation commission's work is not done it's only beginning 
and this sad chapter this sad new chapter is is one that um i think all canadians now have to embrace and really uh under get you know they have to understand the level of um of um what occurred and that should behoove all canadians to understand that mm -hmm. um you know that's this is not going to go away this will not go away and it shouldn't go away uh canada is a it's a you know a safe country it's a good country there are uh sad occasions when things get out of hand like you know in london just a few days ago a really sad yeah. thing that happened there but um you know ca canadians have to embrace this history they really need to embrace it and and the education system has to do its work to make sure that it gets into the curriculum and so that our students are understanding what occurred from a young age and so the work is only beginning yeah so so true and hopefully uh shows like 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 this one with with guests like you and and other people that are sharing the stories uh mouth to mouth face to face uh is 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 going to help a lot too yeah but it's, it's really good that you're uh you know that you're you, you know interviewing me today for instance and it's it's really important i was on a another interview just yesterday like a show like this and so you know this is really important uh stuff that people can you know learn about and uh, but the learning is only beginning with this new chapter is all i can say is that we're in a new learning age now yeah yeah well thank you so much dave uh, you know even in light of, of all of these challenges and the history and and uh but you, you know with your music and art and the community and and the the passion and love uh, that you have your clear, clearly thriving leader and chief of alderville and uh hats off to you and your community and and uh really appreciate you taking the time today well thanks for having me mike i, I really yeah. appreciate it yeah all the best, Dave. Bye-bye, everybody. The best, all the best to you. Thank you for joining the Thriving Mayor Show. Make sure to like and share and tell your friends and colleagues. Mayors are awesome and are the change agents to enhance the quality of living for over 80% of us. Remember what Coach Wooden said, you cannot live a perfect day without doing something for someone who can never repay you. Much love and peace. Until next time.